Hey guys, it's Alex, and today I'm here with a book review for The Girls Are Gone by Michael Broadcorp and Allison Mann. I was given this book for review by Book Publicity Services, for which I thank them very much. This is a true crime book about the world's messiest divorce. David Rucky and Sandra Katsini Rucky battle each other in court for custody of their kids, property, money, everything to do with their divorce. At one point, their divorce was even contested, and during these court battles, Two of their five children disappear. David and his lawyers firmly believe from the beginning that Sandra took the two girls, and Sandra accuses him of all kinds of abuse and other horrible things. The girls wind up being gone for over 900 days, and this tells the story from start to finish of the divorce and the girls who are missing. I just want to add that this is going to be a spoilery book review. This is true crime, it's nonfiction. All these things really happened, so I don't really care too much about spoiling people. If you don't wish to be spoiled, then don't watch this video, but I personally would not be too bothered. I have put off filming this review for a very long time because I had so many thoughts about it. I had a lot of things that I wanted to say and a lot of mixed feelings, and it really did take me a very long time to reconcile all my different feelings because there are aspects of this book that I really loved. and aspects that I couldn't stand in the slightest. I wound up giving this book two stars, but I didn't come to that rating easily. I did think about it for a long while, and I was torn between two and three stars, but at the end of the day, my biggest issue with this book was that I didn't trust the authors, and because I didn't trust the authors, I couldn't justify giving this book a positive rating. From the start, it felt like this book was kind of mismarketed. It makes it sound like it's all about the girls who went missing and it's all about the time the girls were missing when really it's not. And I don't say that as a bad thing because I was fascinated by that aspect of this book, but it does focus more on the divorce. It focuses more on the court and what happened in the court and just the relationship between David Rucky and Sandra Katsini Rucky. It's very much about the law and it doesn't really go into the search for the missing girls at all. Like that's nowhere in this book, but it does cover sort of the trial before the girls went missing and the trial after the girls came home. I kind of expected, just based on the description and based on the title, that it was going to be a lot more about the search for the girls. It was going to cover like the police and what the police did and like what happened while the girls were missing and it didn't very much. Like there was a little bit of that, but it skipped a very long period, like over a year, where nothing really happened and they just skipped from the girls were missing for a few months to the girls have been missing for 900 days or however long. And I don't think that was a bad thing because I really did enjoy the fact that this book was very much centered around the court and around the various trials surrounding this case. But it was different than what I expected going in. My favorite aspect of this book was by far the court and the trials and everything that went along with that. This book is filled with court transcripts and I found them really fascinating. I love law. I love learning about law. I used to read law textbooks for fun when I was in high school. So I just loved reading all of it. It was so fascinating to me. Like I never wanted to put it down. Like if there had been more transcripts in this book, which I don't think is possible because it felt like about half of this book at least was court transcripts. I'd have loved it. Like if they just gave me like the whole court transcript, I'd have probably read that and loved it too. I read this for the crime scene read along and both Cammy and Joni said that they found the court transcripts got a little boring and a little bit much and like there was too much legal information in them, which I didn't find. But like I said, I have read legal textbooks for fun. So that's something that's a personal interest of mine. So I really loved it. But if you are someone who doesn't really like law stuff, who doesn't really care about court transcripts and you'd rather just have it summarized and not have as much legal jargon, this might be a little bit tough for you in that regard. But I loved it. That was my favorite. I thought this was going to be a four star book right off the bat because of that, because of how fascinating it was and all the ridiculous things that went down in this case. The true crime books often have a focus or an angle through which they're telling the story. It's not usually just a third party recounting all the facts point by point. There's usually some kind of angle that they take, whether it's from the perspective of the victim or it's about the crime from a friend's point of view or anything. Like there's usually some kind of angle. In this book, it was the court. They told this story from the perspective of the court almost. And I really can't say how much I love that. Like I 
adored that. It was interesting, it kept my attention, and I just, it was my favorite aspect of this book. If it had been just that, if there really hadn't been anything else influencing on that, this would have been a solid four stars and one of the best true crime books I've read recently. But unfortunately, I had a lot more issues that kind of got more obvious as the book went along. My biggest issue overall, and the reason that this book was two stars, was the lack of trust, but I'm going to talk about some more smaller issues first and then get into that because that is going to be the bulk of this review because that was where most of my issues were. But I'm going to start with the middle section. The middle section was where it kind of lost sight of the court and that was where this book really got rough for me. There are seven chapters or sections of this book, but it can really be split into three major arcs, I guess it could say. The first is the messy divorce, the trial. The second is while the girls are missing, and then the third is after the girls come back. That middle part was where this book got kind of boring for me and it was kind of a drag to get through because we weren't in the court anymore. There were some points where we were at the court again, but it was mostly told from Michael Broadcorp's perspective. Being a journalist, we got newspaper articles from him, but also his search to find the girls, as well as some points from Allison Mann and some points that were just in general explaining what was going on. That section dragged for me. It didn't feel necessary for the story and it felt like a departure from the perspective of the court, which was what made this book interesting and what made this book different and worthwhile. That section just felt like I was hearing from this journalist when I didn't care about the journalist. I cared about this family. I cared about the court aspect of this book. The journalist meant nothing to me and I don't mean that to be rude to him. Like I have nothing against him as a person. It's just his role in this book made it boring. I really didn't care what he did to find the girls. I was more interested in the story of the family or the story of the court. Until that middle section, he had not really been a character in this book at all and it didn't work for me. And the news articles especially were very boring. I like reading news articles. I've read multiple books on journalism. I studied journalism for a bit in school. My father is a reporter. I really like journalism. But the articles felt entirely unnecessary to the book itself. He would say something in the narration that was just like an overview, like, oh, I went and did this and talked to this person. And then he would say the exact same thing in an article a page or two later. And it felt pointless. I felt like I was reading the same thing twice. I did pull one example just to illustrate how much of a problem it was for me. On page 158, he writes in the typical book narration, Grigsby told me that he did not know if MacDonald had spoken with police about the disappearance of Samantha and Gianna, but that he would advise MacDonald not to say a word to police since she had been publicly labeled as a person of interest in the disappearance of the girls. He added, the moment police say person of interest, they're essentially targeting a person for a criminal investigation. And then on page 160, in a newspaper article that Michael Broadcorp wrote at the time, it says, Last evening, Grigsby said he did not know if MacDonald had spoken with police about the missing girls. Grigsby added that he would advise MacDonald not to say a word to police since she now publicly been labeled as a person of interest in the disappearance of the missing Lakeville sisters. The moment police say person of interest, they are essentially targeting a person for a criminal investigation, said Grigsby. It's the same thing, and that's one example, but it felt like all the newspaper articles were like that, or at the very least most of them, and it was very annoying to read because I was reading the same information twice, I was getting the same information twice, and it felt entirely unnecessary to the story. I understand why he wanted to include those articles, but it, it just felt like he did not need to. They didn't contribute anything for me. It just made the whole middle section of this book a boring and repetitive reading experience. A second point is that Alison Mann also had her own point of view sections throughout this book. Not as many as Broadcourt, but they were more split throughout the book, whereas Broadcourt were mostly in the beginning and a few at the end. But I didn't see what her point of view sections added to the book that couldn't be said in the typical third person narration that most of this book was told in. It was jarring and weird and felt so unnecessary. It just felt like she was repeating things or saying things that were entirely subjective and just adjectives and talking about the other paralegal because Alison Mann was a paralegal for the father's law firm. She would talk about the paralegal for McDonald who was representing the mother in this case and say like, oh, she looks really messy and unkempt and unprepared and she dropped a bunch of papers on the floor this one time. And it just felt unnecessary to the story. It felt like there were things that just could have been told in the normal narration of this book 
without this abrupt change to first person for her. It just, it didn't add anything to the book for me, and it was always a little bit weird whenever we switched into her perspective. And finally, the last small point, there were some details about this book that I didn't feel like were fully explained. He would mention that one lawyer, McDonald, who was representing the mother, had made it her mission to abolish family court. And I didn't understand what that meant. Like, I, I do understand in general, she wants to abolish family court. Okay, that makes sense. But how? Why? What does that really mean for the world? Like, what is her goal here, apart from getting rid of that? And it never felt like it was fully explained. Like, I don't agree with her. I'm not saying that I'm on her side and, oh yeah, abolish family court. I did feel like I wanted the book to explain why, to explain what that meant, really. Like, what her overall goal was, apart from just, she wants to abolish this. Like, okay, what does abolishing family court accomplish? I never felt like I got a good understanding of that. And that perhaps is because the authors disagreed with her so much that they were just like, oh, that's just some crazy thing she believes. Which is fine. Like, I'm not saying I agree with that at all. I don't. But I just wanted to understand her overall goal. And at other times, he would just reference specific court orders by the date and not, like, remind the reader what it was. He'd be like, oh yeah, and referencing the September 7th court order, and I wouldn't know what it was. Like, it's not a big deal. I would just, like, flip back through and check. But I really wish there were some points where he could have provided extra context to the people like me who really did it, didn't know and aren't going to remember the specific dates of each order and what happened on them. Like if he'd said something like, oh, the order where David was given custody of all the children. Okay, that makes sense to me. I do remember that. But I don't remember that it happened on September 7th. And there were a few points like that where I had to flip back through the book to check which order meant what. And that got a little bit annoying. And I forgot one last very minor thing, <laughs> which is bad, I know. This is like the third time I've said last minor point before I get to my major point. There were a lot of typos in this book. Normally, typos don't bother me, and I'm especially forgiving of indie books like this. But the problem for me was that this book had so many quotes. There were a lot of court transcripts. There were a lot of newspaper articles. There were a lot of emails and just people talking and things that were direct quotations. And there were typos within those. And the sick in brackets was used several points to denote when something was a typo within a document and they were just including it in its entirety with the typo, but it wasn't used all the time. And there were points where I didn't know if there was just a typo in the court transcript or if it was something that they had messed up in transcribing this book. And that bothered me. When something is in a quoted section and there's a typo and there's no sick to be like, hey, yeah, we know this typo is here. It really does bother me because then I'm like, oh no, I don't know if I can trust this because there's something that's clearly wrong. So what if there's something that's wrong somewhere else in the quoted transcript? And that bothered me. It wasn't a huge deal, but it was something minor that I noticed throughout the book. Now, my major point, my biggest point, I didn't trust the authors. The authors were so incredibly biased for the father. And I'm not saying that I disagree with them. I want to say that up front. I'm not saying that I disagree with any of the points or overall conclusions that the authors made. But they were biased to the point where I didn't feel like I could trust them as the writers of this book. I didn't walk away from this book feeling like I had a good understanding of this case. I walked away from this book feeling like one side's lawyers had told me all about this case. Like, if you take any court case, any criminal case, and the defendant's lawyers explain a case to you, you're going to walk away in favor of the defendant. It's going to be incredibly biased, incredibly one-sided, and that's how this book felt to me. Allison Mann was a paralegal at the father's law firm, and it really did feel like his lawyers were explaining the case to me. So of course he's going to come out looking like the good guy. Of course he's going to come out smelling like roses. And the mother is going to look like this ridiculous woman who's just off her rocker, gone completely crazy, and doesn't make sense at all. And it's not that I even think that's untrue, because I did a little bit of outside research, not loads, but it does really seem like I do agree with the author's general points. But because of the way they wrote this book, I didn't trust them, and I didn't trust this reading experience. I do expect books like this to be kind of biased. That's something that is an expectation. But this was above and beyond what I really expected in that regard. 
a lot of books where they're this biased or where it's by the victim, they make their biases a part of the story. It's a part of what they're telling you is, this is me, this is part of me, this is my life. I'm biased in that regard. And Dave Cullen did that with Columbine. He never once tried to pretend like he was a completely unbiased outsider. He wrote that book from his biased perspective, and that was part of the reason he was writing that book, and he made it part of the book itself. In this, they didn't. They wrote the court cases and the transcripts and all that description like it was an impartial third party writing it, when they were both very involved in this case. Alison Mann was, of course, the paralegal for the father's law firm, and Michael Broadcourt became involved to the point where several of the people on the other side got restraining orders against him. Again, not that I think those restraining orders were gotten in good faith, but he was personally involved, is my point. I would have been much more forgiving if they'd made their biases a part of this book, because I do expect that, because that makes a book interesting and personal, but they didn't, and that was the problem. I also want to add that I have no idea if that was their intention in writing this book, if they were trying to be biased and just like make the father look good, or if it was a failure in the writing. I don't know. I wouldn't speculate. At one point, Broadcourt did discuss that he was very inexperienced in this kind of thing. He wasn't talking about this book, but he was talking about when he was first writing articles about the girls going missing and this family. He was a political journalist. He had no experience in crime writing, and I think it kind of showed. I think that was where part of it, the failure came from. I don't know if the rest was intentional or not, but I do think that was a big issue I had in this book. Compare this to Dave Cullen, who's been writing about crime, writing about gun violence, writing about Columbine for more than 20 years or 15 years or whatever at the time he published that book. And his experience showed so much. In this, his lack of experience really showed and it really affected my experience with the book. The writing itself was fine. It was nothing spectacular. It flowed fine. It got the information across. But the way he was writing, the words he chose, the way he decided to disclose certain information, that was where the issue was for me. And I do have a number of specific quotes and specific examples that I want to give. I don't want, just want to say, I didn't trust the authors and leave it at that. I do have reasons why. And all of these quotes are very small things. They're minor details but they're indicative of the way I felt about this book overall. They kind of illustrate the overall narration and how it felt to me in general. It's not just about these details. These details individually, yes, I had a minor issue, but if it was just them, I'd have overlooked it. But there were many, many examples throughout this book. On page 88, they write, Days after serving pretrial documents, Sandra McDonald and Dee Dee Evafold took off for California. Based on videos they posted on YouTube during their trip, the three women had gone to meet with a woman who had been working to sue the state of California regarding her family court case. The YouTube videos show Sandra McDonald and Evafold acting quite foolish. All this while Sandra's children were missing and McDonald was preparing for trial. I'm not arguing with that statement. I'm not saying she wasn't acting foolish. I have no idea how she was acting. And that's kind of the problem. There's no description of her behavior beyond saying quite foolish, which is incredibly subjective. People have very different definitions of what foolish behavior would be. Acting foolish to him might be acting completely normal to me. I don't know. And he doesn't provide any examples. He doesn't say acting foolish by doing X, Y, Z. He doesn't say like getting drunk and going off partying. He doesn't say any of that. He just says she was acting quite foolish and leaves it at that. And we're just supposed to trust him and take his word for it. And again, if that had been an individual thing, he'd just done something like that once, I wouldn't have really had an issue with it. I'd have just been like, okay, and continued on. But that kind of thing happened a lot more. I can't trust when a nonfiction book continuously makes broad subjective statements about people and their behavior and what it means for their trial. On page 161, a man who was associated with the mother broke into David Ruckey, the father's garage, and they write, violently vandalized his vehicles with a knife while David was at home with his son, Nico. He slashed the tires and damaged some of the interior. That's what happened. We learned that at a later point in this book. And I'm not saying that's not a terrifying situation. That is a terrifying situation. That's absolutely terrifying to be at home with your son asleep and some man breaks in and slashes the tires of your car and damages the interior. That's awful. That's absolutely terrifying. But why, as a journalist, would you use such imprecise, inflammatory language? 
as a reader, I really want to know the facts of a situation. I want to know what specifically happened. I don't want a sensationalized take on it. I don't want to hear that a car was violently vandalized. I want to hear what specifically happened to that car, especially when there is such precise language you could use to describe it that's already there. He slashed the tires. Okay, that's horrifying. That doesn't make it any less horrifying than saying he violently vandalized the car. It just makes it more descriptive and more accurate. And that's kind of what I want from a book like this. I want to know the specific details. That's why I'm reading this book. I don't want someone to say, oh, a violent crime happened. I'm like, wait, what crime? What happened? Give me the details of that. And it bothers me that he felt the need to sensationalize this instead of just giving the facts. Especially because in this case, the facts were sensational enough. They didn't need any more. The fact that someone associated with the mother broke into this father's house and vandalized his car is awful. The facts don't need to be sensationalized. On page 109, the father's lawyer is questioning the psychologist involved in the case. He had interviewed the children, he had interviewed the father, and he'd interviewed the mother. And he was testifying. It's a court's transcript, so I can't read it. I'm just going to summarize what happened. But one of the children in particular accused the father of abuse due to parental alienation. The mother had convinced the children that the father was abusive. So she's questioning the psychologist about one specific child's claim of abuse. First, she illustrates that the older brother denies that this abuse ever happened and that he was never around for any of it. And second, she points to a specific incident that the girl said happened when she was 13, only the father had very little contact with the girl when she was 13. And at the end of the court transcript, the authors write, Lisa had proven to Dr. Gilbertson and the court that Samantha's statements had been false. Here's the thing. After reading that section and seeing the evidence and seeing the way it was presented, do I believe that that abuse occurred? Not particularly. It seems very unlikely. She made it very unlikely that those abuse allegations were true. But when you have a book that's entirely about the court cases, that includes so many transcripts from the court cases, you can't take the legal meaning of words out of the book. I'm not disputing that she made it unlikely at all. I agree. But the word proof is such a strong word in a legal context. And in a book like this, where it's all about the legal context, where dozens and dozens of court transcripts are included, like there are pages and pages and pages of court transcripts in this book. I'm going to look at this from a legal standpoint. And legally, the word prove is such a strong word. And it didn't feel justified in this instance. Yes, Elliot, the lawyer, illustrated how unlikely it was that this abuse occurred. I agree, but I don't think she was up to the burden of proof, not in a legal context at least. She didn't actively prove it false so much as she made it seem very unlikely. And I agree, I don't actually think that the abuse occurred, I don't have a problem with that. My problem is with the language that the authors used in this book. It seemed inappropriate, and it made me not trust them very much at all. It felt like it was very manipulative. And again, I don't know if that was intentional or not. It might have just been his inexperience, a failure in the writing, but it still felt very manipulative. On page 98, the mother is on the stand in a court trial. Her lawyer has asked her many questions, and after her lawyer is finished asking questions, the authors say this. She had the floor, the opportunity, to answer the question. She could have said she didn't believe any parenting time was appropriate that she couldn't bear the thought of her children having contact with their father because he was dangerous. She could have once again said that he had abused her, that she was sure he would turn his abuse towards his children. She said nothing, not a word about abuse. Why? Because there wasn't any. And again, it's not that I disagree with that, it's the language used. It's that these authors take this impartial third-party tone throughout this section of the book, at least. It's in third person. They're just talking about the case itself, the mother is on the stand and they're saying she didn't do it because there was no abuse, period. No abuse. It's not about whether I believe there was abuse or not. It's that they're making that very broad statement. They're making this claim and stating it like a fact, not saying that she didn't say anything about the abuse, probably because there wasn't any. They're saying definitively there was no abuse. And that bothered me. On page 153, in one of Michael Broadcorp's first person sections of the, this book, he says, of a man that he meets who was involved in the mother's side of the case, I was in the presence of pure evil. That's a direct quote that he says about this other person. Again, that's a very broad subjective statement that makes me not trust what these authors say. If they're stating these subjective things as fact, then how am I supposed to know 
what's actually a fact and what's their subjective belief. On page 156, he says, I had never spoken on the phone with the parent of a missing child, but I knew David Rucky wasn't acting. If you had never been on the phone with that, never experienced that, how do you know for a fact that he wasn't acting? Again, I'm not saying I don't believe David Rucky. I'm not saying that I think he was acting. I'm just saying for the authors of this book, how does he know for a fact? And that's really what bothered me. These broad subjective statements throughout the book, this man is evil. I believe this man, so this is fact. That is fact. When it's something that isn't fact, when something isn't proven, it's just very unlikely. If he had treated those things as if they were possible, just unlikely, I would have believed this book a whole lot more. I would have been able to trust this book more. But he didn't. They didn't. If I say he, it's because it feels very much like Michael Broadcorp did most of the writing in this book, but I do intend to say they, to include both authors. At no point did the authors ever look critically at the father, did they ever question his statements. They just took everything that he said at face value. And again, I'm not saying the father was lying. I'm not saying I think the father was lying. In a case like this, I expect everyone to be looked at critically. The father, the mother, the other siblings, the aunts and uncles, anyone who has anything to do with these children, I expect them to be looked at critically. And the fact that David wasn't, and he did several things throughout the book that were fairly questionable. Not saying that I think he was abusing his children, I don't know. But especially considering he did questionable things. At one point, his wife told him that she wanted a divorce and he pulled all five of his children into the room and told her, what are you trying to do here? Tell me what you want. Tell the children what you want. Kids aged about 8 to 14 at the time. And that's a very questionable thing. Again, not saying that means he was abusive, but I expect his behavior to be looked at critically, and it never was. And also in books like this, oftentimes they look at the other person in a positive light at certain points. Not because they believe that person was telling the truth. Like with the mother, it was illustrated she was lying on numerous occasions. That's fine, I don't have an issue with that. Like, that was very much proven. But if you look at the mother as though she was telling the truth, and you look at her argument and what she's saying, and then you point out the specific flaws and where that argument doesn't work, it's very helpful to readers like me who have no experience with this case, who have no prior knowledge, so that we can see, oh yes, this is clear, like, I can see where her logic is flawed, I can see where her logic doesn't work, and that makes it even more clear that she's lying. There was nothing like this in this book. The mother was always the bad guy, always treated as this terrible, horrible person, and the father was always this paragon of goodness. And again, I'm not saying that the father wasn't a great man. I have no idea, honestly. He was almost a non-issue in this book. All they said about the father was basically that he was searching for his girls and he was heartbroken and he was a great guy. Like, whatever. That might be very true, but he wasn't a perfect guy. They had this marriage. He knew this woman for, I think, over 20 years. They were married for a good long time. They had a long engagement. They dated for a long time. And all of a sudden, she just completely changes everything. It didn't make sense. I didn't buy that they had this picture-perfect marriage. He owned a multi-million dollar trucking company, I believe, that was kind of overlooked in this book. Like, they never really went into the fact that he had a ton of money. And it was small things like that that just, I wanted less of a bias in this. I wanted to know more information than I was given. I didn't want this case as told by David Rucky's lawyers, and that's kind of what it felt like I got. It's a divorce case. Things are so messy. This case was so awful. The divorce was awful, like really horrendous. Like, I've read about some bad divorces, but this one really takes the cake. All the ridiculous nonsense that went down, and I'm not saying the mother was a wonderful person because she clearly, A, had a lot of issues, and B, lied a lot, and C, just straight refused to participate in any of the court. When they ordered her to go get psychologically tested, go get drug tested, or whatever, she refused to participate. And they would be like, oh yeah, the father like went to his anger management, went and got drug tested, but they never talked about like, why did he go to anger management? Like, what did that involve? Did he fail any of these tests that he had to like undergo even further stuff that he eventually passed? Like, I wanted more background information on the father that I didn't get. And this book failed in that regard so much. 
I do feel like I walked away with some more information, but considering how hard it is to find a lot of unbiased stuff on this case, most of the information that I found, not all, but most of the information I found came either from Michael Broadcorp, which was basically a lot of what was in this book, or it came from people on the mother's side who were much more biased, it seemed. There wasn't a whole lot of third-party involvement. This wasn't a very well-known case. But I was so disappointed by where this book went. I was so disappointed by the writing and disappointed by the way the authors presented this book. I wanted to love it. I thought I was going to 20 pages in. I thought this was going to be a new favorite and I was going to be begging everyone to pick it up because it was so wonderful and it wasn't. I didn't trust the authors and at the end of the day that's such an important thing in a book. I need to trust the authors, fiction or nonfiction. And because of that, I couldn't recommend this. Like, I'm not saying don't pick it up if you're planning on it. I'm just saying I couldn't recommend this book. I couldn't suggest to anyone that they pick up this book. It wasn't worthwhile for me to read and it made me very angry at points. I was reading this at my boyfriend's and I kept picking out certain lines. Some of the quotes that I read in here, but there were many, many more examples that I didn't bother writing down just because you don't need 40 examples of the same thing. I would read them to him and he'd say like, yeah, like that's pretty awful. It wasn't just me. And I feel like Cammy and Joni both had similar thoughts to me, although I think they both gave this book three stars. But this was a two star read. I couldn't trust the authors and I was very, very disappointed. Although thankful that I did get this for review. I wish it had been a more positive experience. Let me know down below if you read The Girls Are Gone and what you thought of it if you did. And I'm sorry this was such a long review, but I had a lot that I wanted to say and I didn't want to leave anything out. As always, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see y'all again soon.